Welcome. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this Ash Wednesday evening. Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. We have lit the Lenten lights now, and we have begun the journey to Jerusalem with Jesus. All the way, as we said downstairs, all the way to Holy Week, to Thursday's Supper, to Friday's Cross, to Saturday's deep, deep silence, and against all odds, to Sunday's empty tomb. Tonight is Ash Wednesday. Tonight we take the palm branches that once we waved as we came into this room on Palm Sunday and burn them and make them into ashes that we will wear on our forehead in the shape of a cross. Something that was once bright and green and full of life has become ashes. From dust you have come, to dust you shall return. Those are the resounding words of Ash Wednesday, this night, in this place. Welcome. Will you take your program? We'll read together our prayer of confession and we'll sing our assurance of forgiveness as a hymn. Will you stand as we do this together? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice Number 178, how deep the Father's love for us.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. Isn't this a fast I choose? Releasing wicked restraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated, and breaking every yoke. Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them, not hiding from your own family? Then your light will break out like the dawn and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and God will say, I'm here. If you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noon. The Lord will guide you continually and provide for you, even in the parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. They will rebuild ancient ruins on your account. The foundations of generations past you will restore. You will be called mender of broken walls, restorer of livable streets. Here ends the first lesson. Let us pray. God, <coughs> you have gathered us in on this cold March evening on this Ash Wednesday, in this sanctuary that has been witness to countless services full of prayers just like ours now. God, we come here tonight to face our own morality and our own mortality. We come here tonight, O oh Lord, to do that in your presence, your presence that gives us the assurance, the courage, the stamina, the grace to be able to look within and look and see how we are doing as your disciples, as your people, as your church. God, we do this in your presence that gives us the courage, the stamina, the grace, the context to look at our lives and know that we are like these palm branches, green but fading, ashes soon, and that even then we are yours and we are loved. God, be with us this evening as we lean into the first night of Lent together. Help us to ask the hard questions about how we will observe and be faithful in this season. And help us to begin it all with the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray the prayer that is in amongst the gospel lesson that we will read. We join our voices now and pray that prayer as part of our beginning of Lent. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gospel lesson tonight comes from the Sermon on the Mount, and it is from Matthew 6. 
Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so that people will know they are fasting. I assure you that they already have their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you are fasting to people, but only to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Here ends the gospel lesson. According to an old joke, it is said that many people would be shocked by two things, hearing Christianity doubted or seeing Christianity practiced. Yeah, this joke needles at the way that so many Christians profess to believe so much yet practice so little. Tom Long once said, the Christian faith is not just a collection of ideas to be believed, it is also a set of deeds to be performed. There are things that Christians believe because they are Christians, but there are also things that Christians do because they are Christians. When Protestants fell out with the Roman Catholics 500 years ago in Europe, and gave birth to all of us, when they did that, they drove a wedge way down deep between faith and works. They drove that wedge and drove that wedge and drove that wedge. So that any mention whatsoever of works righteousness makes us Baptists really itchy. Yeah, yeah, we don't like that. You see, we Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and all the rest of these Protestant faiths, we followed Martin Luther's lead in the Reformation with the doctrine of solo fide. Solo fide, by faith alone. We believe that there is nothing we can do to earn grace, but rather that grace is a gift given to those who believe. Like any belief born out of conflict, solo fide, faith alone, turned out to be just as extreme as the faith plus works method that it replaced. We Protestants have been guilty, far guiltier than any of our Catholic sisters and brothers, of honing in on belief, of accepting Jesus into our hearts, but neglecting the works that would help us do that. We've been guilty of praying the prayer 
but stopping there. Not all the time, but too much of the time. And sure, we do good things for other people. We've always been good at that. I mean, look at the mission endeavors that churches, Baptist churches, mainline churches have pulled off. We've always been good at doing that kind of thing. But we've also often failed to realize that works work in us too. We've sent missionaries all over the globe to do all kinds of things to work on other people. And we've sometimes forgotten that works work on us when we do them. The Apostle Paul says it best, I think, when he teaches the church at Philippi to work out your faith in fear and trembling, to work out your faith. Now listen, I'm as Protestant as any of you. That's just true. I'm as Protestant as any of you. I believe just as you do that God, not us, does the work of salvation. But I think sometimes we Protestants have chucked out the baby with the bathwater. I think that when it comes to works, we have neglected not only our missions obligations, but the theology of how God works through our works on us, on us. We were so concerned with solo fide and works and righteousness that we forgot that sometimes the work we do does, in fact, depart grace upon us. This is not a rare occurrence, this story. Sometimes people uh, will stop by to talk to the preacher. You, you didn't know that happened, but it does. It, it happens fairly often, actually, you know, in the aisle of the grocery store. Christy and I went Saturday morning. That was a mistake. We like to never got out of there. Uh, we're going to go earlier next time. In the aisle of the grocery store, on the street, in the lobby of CCM, someone will come by my study to talk. Others will see me at a coffee shop, and it doesn't matter how many books and papers are piled up, we're going to have a conversation, and that's great. It happens all the time. I'll stop to chat. The content, the words of the conversation, the questions, they always vary, but underneath, they're all the same, too. Preacher, how can I feel closer to God? Whatever else we talk about, that seems to be the question. Just last Thursday afternoon, toward the end of my day in the office, um, I found a half hour uh, that I didn't have much to do. Don't tell the personnel committee. Um, found a half hour, so I wandered from my office over here to the sanctuary to spend a few minutes walking and praying in this room. This is a great room for that, by the way. Uh, it's, it's not a great room for weddings all the time because we don't have the coveted center aisle, but it's a great room to walk and pray in because we have two aisles. And you can walk this room, and you can walk this room, and you can pray in here. And I was doing that Thursday afternoon when one of the volunteers uh, from downstairs, who was gearing up to feed people downstairs, wandered up the steps and stuck her head through the door um, uh, to talk uh, or to look into the room. That's what she came up for. I wanted to see the, the church. And so we stopped. And we talked. And a lot of words were said, but you know the questions she asked, don't you? Preacher, how can I feel closer to God? I told her that there were no quick and easy formulas for such a thing. Don't ever fall for that myth. There are no quick and easy formulas for such a thing. Sometimes God feels silent 
even distant to me too, I told her. She said that she believed with all her heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, just as Peter had blurted out, just like that she believed it. It seemed oddly to me that solo fide, faith alone, had left this young woman flapping in the wind. She had the belief, but she didn't feel God's presence. You'll be glad to know that I invited her to church. Please tell the personnel committee that. Yeah, I did, I did that not only because I like to have people at church just like you do, but I did that because, because church is where I learn to work out my faith in fear and trembling. I invited her to church not because she was unable to profess Christ as Lord. She seemed to have that down. I invited her to church because she was looking for a way to work that out in her life. We Protestants have been pretty bad about that one, folks. We, we pray the prayer, we say we believe it, but the working it out day by day, month by month, year by year, that's the tough part. That's what church does for me. That's what Ash Wednesday and Lent do for me. They are my favorite seasons of the year, by the way, these seasons. They help me find ways to bring my faith to expression in some kind of works. They help me find practices that sustain me and bring me nearer to God. You know, no matter which year it is, no matter which lectionary cycle we're in, A, B, or C, we always get the same gospel lesson on Ash Wednesday. It doesn't change. Every year, we gather in this room on this night, and it's the same gospel lesson. Yeah. Every year, we read those words from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus himself stands up in a crowd of disciples and teaches them about three works. Three works. It's right there, right in our face. Three works that will help us be disciples, that will help us be faithful. As I read the gospel lesson, did you pick them out? Did you hear them? Almsgiving was the first one. Prayer was the second one. And fasting was the third one. I know that last one's not the most popular idea going these days, but it's right there in the Bible, folks. I didn't make it up. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, these three works Jesus prescribes in the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples. And every year on Ash Wednesday, the church reads them. It's not much of a stretch to start to begin to see what Lent is all about from that. Whenever you give to the poor, Jesus says, don't blow your trumpet that you might get praise for it. When you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. God sees what you do and God will reward you. Almsgiving has a very public dimension to it. We take up an offering every Sunday morning. The plate comes by and you look down the aisle. What are they going to think if I don't drop something in there today, right? Yeah, it has a very public dimension to it. Sometimes we have to do that, like the Super Bowl of caring. I can tell you CCM benefits from that big time. Like the dessert auction. How could we get all that money for the youth and children if we didn't have Lawrence down there rattling it off and people making public bids, running up desserts? Almsgiving has that dimension to it. 
Jesus himself talked about the widow's might even, pointed that out, talked about it, said that's the way to do it right up there in front of everybody. So that's where that happened in the temple. So what does he mean here? What does he mean when he says give so secretly and quietly that your two hands that are both connected to the same brain don't know what each other are doing? When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, he says. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. Don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Man, that text is as fresh today as it ever was. You know how many words we get hit with a day? Mercy. Yeah. Prayer is something that we do secretly, but we do it together too, right? We did it downstairs just a minute ago. We did it right here just a minute ago. Prayer is something we do by ourselves, but it's something we do together too. Think about a worship service that has no prayer in it. What in the world would that even be? What would that look like? Jesus himself stood in the synagogues and prayed. Stood at the, oh wait, at the Sermon on the Mount and prayed, taught the disciples to pray. What does he mean here? Saying these things about going off and praying in the prayer room over there with the door closed. Hint, hint, Lent is here. What does he mean by all that? And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so that people will know they're fasting. Don't let your hair be unbrushed or your face be unwashed. Please don't do that. But look to other people as if you are not fasting. Do it in secret, he says. Fasting is not a popular notion in America, folks. It's just not. There's no way around it. Fasting's not popular, but fasting is biblical. It's right there. It's right there in the Sermon on the Mount. How are we to do it, to keep at it, if we don't do it together? It's so hard. It's so very hard to do it, especially if you pick something that really matters, right? Yeah, I'm going to give up Coke, but I really don't like Coke. You know, that's easy. But I'm going to give up Facebook, and I spend hours on Facebook a day. And then day two, you're pulling your phone out of your pocket and going, oh, nope, oh, nope, right? It's hard if you pick something that's hard, that that matters. How will we do it if we have to do it in secret by ourselves with no support? What does Jesus mean when he says these things? I believe that Jesus says these things to unhitch, to disconnect the outward results from the inward effect. The outward results from the effort itself. Said another way, I believe Jesus is trying to get his disciples to focus on their own faith rather than everybody else's. Do you hear that? I think that's what he's doing. You know how much time we spend focused on other people's faith, church? We're bad to do that too. I think Jesus is trying to get us to focus on our own faith. Yes, 
Almsgiving benefits others, but it also benefits the giver. It sure does. When you give and you give and you give all that you can give and you can still eat and you still have heat and you still have friends and you still have means, you learn that money isn't God, that life is larger than the bottom line. When you take time away from the things in life that seem so pressing, so important, so urgent, and use that time to pray, to sit idle for a little while, to breathe in and out, and trust that God's working in the world without you, well, it doesn't really matter what effect the prayer has somewhere else. It's already working on your soul. You start to learn that you're not as rushed, not as hurried, or that you don't have to be anyway. And when you give up something for a while, perhaps for 40 days in Lent, hint, hint, hint. When you give up something that's difficult to give up, something that you go, oh, I couldn't possibly give that up, couldn't possibly say no to that for 40 days. When you give up something and you realize 40 days later, that your life is still there, you're still okay, you're even better than you were when you started. You felled another idol in your world. That's what fasting does. Do you see how Jesus is unhitching the effect so that we can focus on the effort? Brothers and sisters, that's the answer to the question. Preacher, how can I feel closer to God? I get asked that question more than you might think. There are no magic formulas, no silver bullets, no quick tricks. Anybody that tells you that is misleading you. But there are some things straight from the mouth of Jesus that can help you get there. Almsgiving, prayer, fasting. Things that if you unhitch them from the effect, I promise you will help you work out your faith in fear and trembling on the way to Easter. Lent is here. Let's do this. Our Ash Wednesday hymn is number 168 in your hymnal. I take the cross of Jesus Christ. We'll stand as we sing.
Let's read a prayer together. It's number 166 in your hymnal if you turn back a page. The rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Lord God, who cleansed the earth through 40 days of floods, who revived Elijah through 40 days of pilgrimage, grant us grace to enter the flood, the fire, the desert. that leads us to Gethsemane and the dark scene of Golgotha. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
If you would, please stand for the benediction. Lent is here. How will you keep it? How will you lean in and let God bless you this season? As you ponder that, as you go from this place, go with this benediction. May the strength of Christ, and you need that in Lent, may the strength of Christ uplift you. The comfort of the Holy Spirit, you need that in Lent too. May it surround you. And may the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage. Yeah, that too. Today, tomorrow, every day as you go in peace. Amen.